and welcome back once again. Uh, this is the video series where I go over my lectures, uh, trying to help you fill in the cracks if you're in my class, and if you're not, trying to hawk you my book, uh, in which I show you how to solve the kinds of questions that you will see in your Principles of Microeconomics class. Uh, questions about things like efficiency, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. Uh, and specifically what we're going to be talking about in regards to efficiency is what markets do and sort of why they exist and why economists tend to be fond of them. Uh, and that has to do with something called the scarcity principle, which we have talked about before. Right? The scarcity principle tells us that there's only scarce amounts of pretty much everything. Right? There's only so much stuff in the world to make any given type of good. And even if you didn't have to worry about resources, you'd still have to worry about the limited amount of time that we have to do stuff. Uh, that's always going to be the case. So how, what are we going to do? We have all this stuff. What are we going to do about it? And uh, so we have this problem. And it's a problem that we can't avoid. It's the problem of how to allocate stuff. Uh, and this problem is always going to be around no matter what we do, whether we continue to be a capitalist economy or whether we switch to being a communist economy or something in the middle, uh, where there's always going to be the problem of how do we allocate the stuff that we have. And additionally, how do we decide what stuff to make in the first place? And that's really what markets are, is that markets are one way of answering this question. What stuff do we make and how do we allocate the stuff that we have? Okay, and so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at markets as a way of allocating stuff and, and what we get out of that and how they tend to be good at it. Uh, but we're also going to think about some of the uh, other ways that we could be allocating stuff and thinking about, okay, well, uh, what would happen if we allocated things in different ways? After all, that's the question that we have to answer. We can't get around answering the question of who's, what are we going to make and how are we going to allocate it? But markets are not the only way to do that. So, for example, uh, there are lots of other things that you could do. Uh, you could have just some person sitting in a room somewhere deciding who's going to get what. That's certainly one option. Uh, you could have violence or influence uh, being the way that you allocate stuff. You could just decide that whatever stuff people have, whoever can beat each other up gets to take it. That's one possibility. Certainly uh, a lot of humanity has lived their lives in that way. Uh, you, can, uh, you can require people to do some sort of arbitrary useless task to prove that they have earned the right to the stuff. Uh, so, for example, if you've ever tried to get a ticket to a show, uh, concert that you knew was going to be popular, or you tried to get an iPhone on the first day, you know that you have to wait in line. What did the do waiting in the line provide for anybody? Did it make Apple better off that you waited in the line? No, not really. It was just a waste of your time. But it was the way that they decided to allocate the iPhones. Whoever was in the front of the line got the iPhone. That's certainly one way to allocate stuff. Uh, you can also have a market where people exchange things with each other. So it's going to be important to think about how these different ways of answering this very important question operate. Uh, what are they going to do well? When, when, when are they going to do well and when are they going to do poorly? And in what sorts of contexts are they going to do well or poorly in? And that's what we're going to be looking at today. And just to sort of give you a bit of a preview, we're going to come down to the conclusion that markets tend to be a really good way to decide what stuff gets made and to decide how it gets allocated. Uh, and we're going to go through all of the reasons why that is the case. And we're also going to cover some of the caveats and some of the ways in which it maybe is not a great way to allocate stuff. But in general, today is going to be largely about showing why markets are really good at this particular task, uh, which also makes this one of the more political parts of the course. Uh, but don't worry if this offends your political sensibilities, then don't worry if you just wait long enough, everybody else's political sensibilities will be offended as well. Uh, big surprise, uh, political ideology doesn't tend to line up that cleanly uh, with, e with economics in any degree. So, you know, hang in there, and if you're angry, just be reassured that other people will be angry too. So, uh, some, some points to, to, to clarify, though, as we go into that, given that this is one of the more politically uh, active topics in the class. Uh, first thing to remember is that we're talking here about competitive markets. We're talking about why competitive markets are a good way to allocate stuff and to decide what stuff gets made. And importantly, competitive markets are not the same thing as free markets. Typically, when you are having a political discussion about uh, how much markets should be allowed to do, the topic of a discussion is free markets. And a free market is a market that has no sort of government intervention with it. 
But what we're talking about here are competitive markets. And competitive markets are what we've been talking about for a while, right? They're so large relative to each individual supplier that nobody has control over the price, right? Everybody is a price taker. You're just one little atom in this very big market. Uh, and these are not the same thing. You can have competitive markets that are not free, and you can have free markets that are not competitive. So, for example, uh, no one is, uh, you, you could easily call uh, the market for, say, phones uh, pretty, pretty free, right? There's not a whole lot of government intervention requiring you to sell phones in a particular way. There's some, but not a whole lot. It's pretty free. But it's not a very competitive market. There's Apple, and there's Samsung, and uh, I guess there's some other guys, but like, there's not a lot of competition there, right? There's some very big companies that control it. So that's an example of a market that is free, but not competitive. Similarly, you can have a market that's competitive, but not free. Uh, the sale of stocks, for example, is very highly regulated. There's, the, there's a whole government agency basically dedicated to the laws about selling and buying stocks. And yet the stock market is highly competitive. So just a quick reminder that everything you're thinking about with regards to free markets may or may not apply when we're talking about competitive markets. We're talking about competitive markets here and how awesome they are. Secondly, we want to keep track that right now what we're trying to do is we're trying to describe the world. Okay, we're trying to describe the world. Uh, we're not trying to describe what we think the world should be like or how we would like the world to be. We're just trying to describe how the world is and the efficient results that we get out of that. Right? This whole thing's about efficiency. Uh, we're, we're not trying to uh, make arguments about what we want the world to be like, just how the world tends to operate. So with that all in mind, let's get a recap of what we're about to go through. So we are going to say that markets are a system that allocates good. That's what they do. They decide how much stuff and decide is a strong word. Nobody's actually deciding, right? It's a market. There's lots of different uh, uh, participants who are all making their own individual decisions. But as a result of all those individual decisions, uh, it is determined what stuff gets made and it's determined who gets that stuff. And the markets are a system that do that. And there are other ways to do that besides markets as well. Typically, the way that this works is according to the laws of supply and demand. And the point, the argument that we're going to be making today is that by allowing this competitive market to do its thing, we are going to end up with what's called an efficient use of our resources. And we're also going to talk about how the use of the market to allocate goods guides how goods are allocated, right? How does it actually work? And let's start with an example. Uh, and in particular, this example is about snow shovels. Uh, now, I am filming this from Southern California, and no one has particularly needed a snow shovel in a long, long time. And so if you went to a hardware store to buy a snow shovel, it might cost you like 30 bucks. Okay. So, but now imagine for a second. Imagine that Southern California is shockingly and surprisingly covered in six feet of snow. No one's ever seen it before. Nobody has a snow shovel to shovel their lawn with. Everyone's trapped inside. Uh, and everyone really wants a snow shovel, right? And just think about this for a second. Just, it's good to get in the habit. We hear about this change. What is shifting about the supply and demand curves? Just think about that for a second. And you should be thinking that the demand for snow shovels is shifting to the right. Yeah, people want more snow shovels, shifts to the right. That should increase the equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity. And let's say, for example, that as a result of this shift, the equilibrium price for snow shovels has risen from $30 to $45. Now, imagine that you are the owner of a, snow, of a hardware store that sells snow shovels and you wake up on the morning of the freak snowstorm and you look out your window and you say, oh my goodness, I have a whole closet full of snow shovels. I could be really making some bank on these. So you rush out to the, to the floor of your store and you scribble out $30 and you write in $45. All right. So I want you to think, is what you just did here completely fair? Is it acceptable? Is it unfair? Or is it very unfair? How would you feel about doing this? Or how would you feel if you found out that somebody else did this? Would you be angry at them? Would you pretty much understand? So in general, uh, the answer to this question will depend quite a lot on who you ask. When I ask this question to a room full of people who are planning to major in business, they tend to think this is pretty okay. Uh, but if you ask this to a room full of people who are not planning to major in business, as was done by Kahneman, Netsch, and Thaler in 1986, about 82% of them say that this is unfair or very unfair, right? This is price gouging is effectively what this is. So you can imagine uh, waking up on the day and looking out your window and saying, oh, look at all that snow. Uh, it's too much snow. People are going to want to buy snow shovels. I can charge as much as I want for snow shovels. Uh, and then you think, well, but if I do that, then people will be angry at me and they'll retaliate against me later. 
all right? So instead, I will not adjust my prices for snow shovels, okay? So if you keep from adjusting your prices, right, that is basically saying that you're not going to allow the market to determine what the price of snow shovels should be. You're going to take some sort of outside of the market factor, worrying about people retaliating it against you, uh, and you're not going to adjust your prices. You're basically not going to allow that rightward shift in demand to result in the rise in prices that you would expect it to in equilibrium, right? You're not allowing the market adjustment to happen. So what's going to happen, right? So basically in this situation, we've taken a good that's being sold in a market and gone to the equilibrium price of $30. And we're saying, well, okay, the price should be going up, uh, but we're not going to let it. We're not going to let it adjust. What effect is this going to have? Well, first of all, just think about it, right? This is effectively uh, keeping the price too low. And what happens when the price is too low? Well, we get excess demand. Uh, we get a, uh, a shortage of snow shovels. At this higher level of demand, a lot of people want to buy snow shovels. Uh, certainly more people want to buy snow shovels at the, if the price is still $30. But the amount of snow shovel that's going to be provided is not going to be any higher than it was before. So, you know, you're going to wake up, you're thinking, well, I don't want to raise the price on the snow shovels, but at, when, if the price was $30 yesterday and I was only willing to keep this many snow shovels in stock, I really see no reason to bring in more snow shovels. I'm not going to make any additional profit on them. Uh, so I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to sell it at $30, but I'm not going to bother restocking once I run out. And you can sort of imagine how this goes, right? This is a pretty standard situation if you think about some sort of emergency, right? An emergency happens, people go, they clear out the stores, and then they're gone, right? The stores are empty. Um, so we've decided not to raise the price of our snow shovels, which means that we are going to have this excess demand, okay? And with excess demand, we get back to the problem that we talked about earlier. We have the problem of how do we decide who gets the stuff? How do we allocate the stuff that we have? It's a pesky problem because it doesn't go away just because we've decided not to follow the whims of the market. So we still have to figure out how do we allocate the stuff. Uh, and there's a lot of ways we could go about it. We could try to figure out who needs the snow shovels the most and get it to them. That's difficult because we don't actually know who needs the snow shovels the most. Uh, we could decide to just sell it to our close friends. Right? We can say, okay, well, we've got, we only have so many snow shovels. So, you know, hey, uh, buddy and Billy, come on down. I have a snow shovel for you. Uh, and then, you know, you'll get me back uh, when we go up to the mountains in the uh, next, next spring. Uh, you could save them for powerful people. Try to curry some favor, right? You could say, okay, well, hey, everybody, I'm out of snow shovels. I don't have any snow shovels left, but secretly you got one waiting in the back that you're holding on to for the mayor. Uh, and so you're going to hold on for that. Uh, maybe you can make people wait in line. Whoever gets to your store the fastest gets to have the snow shovels. That's how we actually typically handle these scenarios. And maybe holding a couple for our friends as well. Uh, and this doesn't make sure that the people, but I mean, that doesn't really get us to what we want, which is making sure that the people who want the snow shovels the most are the ones who get them, right? Instead, we get the people who showed up the earliest. Uh, and it could be the people who need the snow shovels the most are the ones who are still trapped in their houses. But they're not getting it, right? Because they're not going to be able to get to your store very quickly. So we're back to that same old problem, that we don't know how to allocate this stuff. So let's imagine that we did allow the market to act in a competitive way, and we allowed the market to adjust as it sort of wants to adjust. What would happen? So. Uh, we would have this shift in demand and it would increase the equilibrium price. And let's draw that out. So we have our good old supply and demand curves. We have our original equilibrium price of 30. And we get a rightward shift in demand that's going to increase us up to D prime. And our new equilibrium price is 45. Now, we're going to allow the uh, price of the snow shovels to adjust. We're not going to be worried anymore about people retaliating against us for uh, raising the price. What's going to happen? So the price has just gone up. Now imagine that you are a snow shovel seller who lives outside the area. Okay, so right now I'm in Orange County uh, and the price has just gone up and I'm, I'm rolling in dough. I'm, taking, I'm making $45 per snow shovel. Now imagine that you are a snow shovel seller in neighboring Riverside or in Los Angeles. And of course, it's not snowing there, but you look at Orange County and you say, hey, look at that. They're making $45 a snow shovel. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to gather up all your snow shovels. You're going to get in the car and you're going to drive to Orange County and sell them. Meaning that people are basically going to be responding to the incentive exactly as you'd expect them to. The price goes up. People respond by joining the market. As long as there's enough time for people to make those sorts of responses, that means that 
you know, basically the supply curve is going to be shifting to the right. What happens when more sellers come into the market, when all the Riverside snow shovel sellers and the Los Angeles snow shovel sellers pick up their trucks and they move in here, that increases the number of sellers, which of course shifts supply to the right. What happens when supply shifts to the right? Well, let's draw it out. We're going to draw a rightward shift in supply. Which is going to bring the price back down. Uh, and additionally, this is going to solve our excess demand problem. Notice that at all three of these points, the quantity supplied equaled the quantity demanded. The price itself ensured that there was no excess demand because the market was able to adjust properly. Uh, which means that you know we're not going to be saving any snow shovels for our buddies or for the mayor uh, or for whoever waits in line first. In fact, there's not going to be a line because everyone who wants to get a snow shovel is going to come and there's going to be plenty for everybody, at least everybody who wants one. And so this is sort of getting at one of the things that the market is good at doing. If we didn't allow the market to adjust, we might have ended up with a lower price that felt better, but it also meant that the snow shovels that were really needed in Orange County were instead waiting in Riverside and Los Angeles, and nobody was going to bother to bring them in because there's no additional incentive to do so. If they had a, if they had a reason to bring in the snow shovels at $30, they would have already done it because it was already $30, right? So uh, the market is going to be able to adjust to make sure that the resources really go where they're needed, uh, or at least where they're wanted and where people are willing to pay for them. And this adjustment is not something that you get with all of the other ways of allocating goods, uh, which is one of the benefits of the market system, that it allows these responses to happen. Uh, we can sort of think about how this is, whole process is playing out behind the scenes in terms of profit. Right? We want to think about this in terms of profit. Let's draw, uh, as we have before, uh, a graph where we have the supply and demand curve on the left. And then that leads over to the right to our individual firm. We've drawn this once or twice before. Now, let's say that we've just had this shift in demand to the right. And we can follow that price over. And with that new shift in demand to the right, we can see that we're going to make a profit, right? We set price equal to marginal cost. That gives us our quantity, Q star. We look at the average cost at Q star. That gives us our average cost. And then we have our profit box. Okay, so we're making a profit. Now remember, this is economic profit. So it's not just that we're making money. We're making more money than we would make if we were doing something else. Which means that we're making more money selling snow shovels in Orange County than we would if we were selling snow shovels in Riverside. Which means that the snow shovel sellers in Riverside, is gonna, are gonna, they're going to have an incentive to come into Orange County and, and, and to bring the goods where they're actually needed. This additional profit is the incentive that brings them in. And that is the incentive that then, as a result, shifts supply to the right, bringing price back down and lowering those profits. You can see how that new profit box is smaller than the old one, which is interesting because it sort of suggests that an increase in profits is sort of self-defeating and temporary, which makes sense in a competitive market. If you're making a profit, if you're making a, some additional money above and beyond what you need to get paid, then someone's going to come in and compete with you for it and it's going to go away. And that's exactly what's happening here. Those additional profits bring in new competitors, which bring back down the price. Which means that if we were worried about that price gouging thing, right, where the price goes up uh, and we don't like how high the price has gone in this disaster, then by allowing it to adjust, that brings in more snow shovels and brings the price back down. Which means that not only do we get back down some on the price, that we don't see that same jolt in the price that we were worried about, but we end up doing it with more snow shovels than we had before. If we had kept the price at 30 to begin with, then we would have a price of 30, but we would be limited in the number of snow shovels that are actually available where they're needed. But by allowing the price to adjust, the price will go up and then come back down as people have the chance to adjust and bring in their snow shovels from outside. And we will end up with more snow shovels as a result because of that adjustment, because those new people are coming in. Now, interestingly, I think I've used that word a number of times here. Uh, we can follow this logic 
to its to its extension. You know, not only you know after this after the supply curve shifts, we still have a profit here, which means that there's still new firms that are going to want to come in, which means that the supply curve is going to shift again to the right. And the supply curve is going to shift again to the right, and that's going to lower the price even more and make the profits even smaller. But there's still a profit, which means that more suppliers are going to come in, shifting the supply even more to the right. And that's going to keep happening until there's no profit left to be had. Right? If there's any profit, then more people are going to come in and compete with you to get that profit away. And so that, those profits are going to be temporary, which means that we're always going to go back to the zero profit point. So in the long run of a competitive market, and this is the point that I'm really trying to get at, in the long run of a competitive market, you end up with zero profit for the firms. Basically, you're paying them exactly what you need to pay them to get them to do this and not a cent more, which is good. That's efficient, right? You're not sort of stuffing their pockets with more money than they need to you know, justify doing their jobs. You're paying them exactly the, basically to cover their costs, which is a very efficient use of your resources. Uh, and that's going to be an efficient thing to do. And it also means that, you know, if we think about something like this that leading to profits, those profits are going to be temporary. We're going to get back to that zero profit point. If there are positive profits, people are going to join the market, bringing the profits down. If there are negative profits, if there are losses going on uh, where the price is too low, that means that firms are going to leave the market, which is going to reduce the amount of competition, shift supply to the left, and bring prices back up. So wherever prices are, if you're not at a point where the firms are making zero profit, it's going to move towards the zero profit point. Positive profits, more people, bring the prices down. Negative profits, a loss, you lose people, bringing the prices back up. And everything sort of gravitates towards this zero profit point. We can draw out how this works as a loss as well. If we draw out our same deal, where we have supply and demand on the left, and we're going to have marginal cost and average cost on the right, but this time we're going to draw it so that we are making a loss. Follow the price over there, that's where it hits average cost, or that's where it hits marginal cost, that gives us our quantity. Follow that up to average cost and that gives us our profit, or our profit. but this time profit is negative, right, because price is lower than average cost, so we, what we really have is a loss. Since we have a loss, that's going to make firms want to leave the market. When firms leave the market, that shifts supply to the left, fewer producers raising the price. And that price is going to get raised up and up until we eventually get back to the zero profit point, at which point nobody else is going to need to leave the market. So it works basically the same way from positive profits to none as it does from negative profits, losses to none. Now some important things to keep in mind for this whole thing to work, for us to get that zero profit result and also to get that, uh, you know, these price increases are going to be temporary. Uh, first of all, this depends on there being free entry and exit for the firms. It has to be very easy for those adjustments to happen. It has to be very easy for the snow shovel seller in Riverside to pick up and come here. Uh, if there was some sort of snow shovel selling license that they needed to get first, that they needed to spend time to get so they wouldn't be able to respond right away, well then this wouldn't happen and we, we would be able to maintain those positive profits for a while. Uh, similarly, there has to be free exit. If firms are making a loss, then they need to be able to get out. And if they can't, then those losses will stick around for a while and we won't get back to that zero profit. So this all depends on the ability to adjust. And so we really say that this is something that happens in the long run. It's not going to be immediate, right? The price of snow shovels goes up and you raise your price. Yeah, you're going to make a profit for a while. It's going to have to take time until people respond and bring in new snow shovels for those profits to go away. Lastly, and this is an additional little side note, uh, we've talked before about the longer you have to respond, the more elastic things get. And that's very much true here. Where, however, whatever, wherever whatever happens to the price, if we give things long enough to respond, we're going to go back to that same price where profits were zero. Think about what that means. No matter what happens, we always go back to the same price. The same price every time is basically the same as saying that the supply curve in the very long run once you've had time for all these adjustments to happen, is perfectly elastic. It's perfectly flat if you give them long enough to respond, which is pretty interesting, right? In the short run, we know that the supply curve slopes up, uh, but you know you raise the price and you'll see that response, that, and then you'll see an increase in quantity supplied. But in the long run, uh, you might still see that increase in, quantities in, in quantity, but it's going to go back down to that same price that it was before. 
uh, because firms are going to come in until they get to the point where there's no profit, which is going to be at the zero profit point, which is always at the same price where marginal cost and average cost cross. That's where our zero profit point is. So I've gone on and on about how this gets us to the zero profit point over and over, right? And, and uh, how this really gets us to provide goods in the right spot. But what does it actually mean for our original question of allocating goods? What does this mean about who allocates the goods and who gets them? Uh, it means, of course, that goods are going to be produced at zero economic profit. You're not going to be wasting any resources on getting the people to make the stuff for you. It also means that our lowest cost producers, if we're going to be following the, the increasing opportunity cost principle, so the most efficient producers are going to be the people making the goods. And also the people who are going to be buying the goods are going to be the people with the highest marginal values, the people who want it the most, which is exactly what we want, right? Uh, we don't want the person who can happen to get to the front of the line to get the tickets. We want the person who really, really wants to see the show to get the tickets. Uh, so that's basically how this is going to work into allocation, that we're going to get our lowest cost producers, our highest value consumers, which is going to be the most effective use of our resources. It's going to be the most efficient. Now, this is all in the long run once everybody has had time to adjust. And, but even in the short run, we're going to get that the competitive market can produce the most possible surplus from a market. Market, and that's what efficient means. The efficient in economic terms just means that we've maximized the economic surplus. There's no way to get any more economic surplus out of this good than to follow the competitive market effectively. Uh, so to see how this works, we can imagine that we're not going to allow the market to adjust fully. Let's imagine that we put a price ceiling on the good. We put a maximum price on the good, sort of like when we had with our snow shovels earlier, or if we had some sort of you know, government regulation that kept us from raising the prices. Now in this case, the price cannot go above the ceiling. And you can think about how this works out from the point of view of everybody in the market. From the point of view of a producer, the price just dropped, which is not so good for you. Uh, but because the price just dropped, you're not going to be willing to supply as much. And because you're not going to be willing to supply as much, there's going to be some units of the good that you could have produced for which your marginal cost is lower than the marginal benefit it would have provided to somebody. But you're not going to do it because you're not going to get paid enough. Now, obviously, that is not the most efficient use of our resources. We have some units out there that, if they were sold, would make people better off. It would make the seller better off because they would get a price higher than, they, than their marginal cost. It would make the consumer better off because they would get a good that they value at more than the price that they had to pay for it. And yet, it's not going to happen. And that's the key behind the idea of, uh, of losing out on surplus. Right? We're going to be talking about something called deadweight loss, uh, which is basically a measure of how much surplus we could have had, but don't, because not all of these surplus maximizing things that could have happened did happen. So we're going to add this idea of deadweight loss, right, surplus that we didn't get, onto our basic idea of consumer surplus and producer surplus that we had before. So first of all, we're going to start out by drawing a, a market that is allowed to get to the competitive equilibrium point. So we're going to have supply, we're going to have demand. There's our equilibrium price and quantity, P star and Q star. And consumer surplus is always going to be the area below the demand curve and above the price, right? We covered this before, right? It's the difference between the marginal value that you get and the price that you had to pay. So we're going to fill in that whole triangle, and that's going to be our consumer surplus. Similarly, producer surplus is everything between the supply curve and the price. It's the difference between what you get paid and what you would have accepted. So this whole triangle down here, that's going to be producer surplus. Now, uh, this is basically a measure of how much consumers and producers get out of the market. How happy are they that the market exists? How much worse off would they be if this market were gotten rid of entirely? They would lose out on all this nice surplus that they would have gotten. So let's imagine what's going to happen if we limit this market in some way. Let's put on that price ceiling. So we're going to draw the same supply and demand as before. But this time, we're going to put a price ceiling on there. Okay, We're not allowed to charge more than that. Now, as we said before, with the price ceiling on, these suppliers are going to say at a certain point, you know what, it's not worth it for me to sell anymore because the price is too low. So that's going to be the quantity that we end up trading and producing and buying QS. Right? That's going to be determined right? because the price is too low. It's going to be the suppliers who are going to say, you know what, I'm done. I've had enough. I can't produce any more for you. Okay, So we can follow that up. 
And you can notice that, you know, we used to be producing at Q star, but now we are producing at QS. So the difference between QS and Q star, all those units between QS and Q star, those are the units that we could have sold, but no longer are selling. So that's the part of surplus that we're no longer going to get. If you look at our graph on the left, you can see that, you know, if I cut off uh, the surplus, or the, if I cut off the quantity, that's going to sort of form a little area. These are, that's the surplus that we were getting from those units that we're not going to get anymore. So we're going to fill in this area, and we're going to call this dead weight loss, or DWL. That's the surplus that we are no longer getting because we're not selling those units anymore. We can also put in producer surplus, which as before is between the supply curve and the price, producer surplus down here, and consumer surplus, which is the area between the demand curve and the price. Now consumer surplus in this case is no longer going to be a triangle, but it'll still be below the demand curve and above the price. And importantly, it will stop uh, at the quantity that we're actually selling because you can't get surplus from units that you didn't buy. That's where it's going to stop. Now, one example of this is rent control. Rent control is an example of a price ceiling. If an apartment is rent controlled, then you cannot pay more than the rent control price for it. Uh, and uh, so how does this work out? So obviously, uh, people who sell apartments are probably not that big a fan of the rent controls, right? The price is lower. They're not big fans of lower prices. Obviously, not for them. And that's what we can see here with the fact that producer surplus is so small. But how about the consumer side? Turns out that the consumer side is going to get split into two. If you're a consumer who manages to get an apartment, then that's fantastic, right? You are very happy about that because you get an apartment and the price is very low, so you get a low-priced apartment. You love low prices, and that's fantastic. But what if you're a consumer who can't find an apartment? And we know that there are gonna be consumers who can't find apartments because at this low price, there's gonna be excess demand, as always, if the price is too low. Now, those consumers are gonna lose out on the surplus they would have had from getting an apartment. Uh, and that's not going to be good for them. So we got some consumers who are very happy. If you do find an, an apartment, you're very happy. But if you can't find an apartment because suppliers aren't willing to provide enough of them at this low price, then you're not going to be happy about it at all. Uh, so that's sort of how, it, how these effects will break down, right? That it, it, um, we have this uh, group in mind that we're trying to benefit, right? The reason that we have the rent control is to make lives better off for tenants. Uh, and that's going to work. It's going to work. Some the people who are tenants are going to end up much better off because they are going to have lower prices. But it also means that it's going to keep some people from being able to be tenants uh, because there's not going to be enough quantity supplied for them to be able to buy. There's going to be this excess demand, which is too bad. So producers are going to lose from this arrangement. Consumers are going to win if they can find an apartment, but not all of them are going to be able to. And we can think about the effects of this policy in general. Right? The goal here is to provide these low-cost apartments, which it does, uh, but we're going to have to still deal with the fact that we have an allocation problem. We have an excess demand, and we have more people who want apartments than we have apartments to give, so we have to figure out some other way besides the market of allocating those apartments to people, which means that we're going to go back to some of those other ways that we talked about before. How are we going to allocate these apartments? Uh, well, again, how do we know who might want it the most? We don't know. Maybe we're going to give it to our friends. Maybe we're going to give it to people in power. Those are things that could certainly happen. And often, people who have a lot of power have the ability to sort of get things to go their way. And so if you have an excess demand and you have one of the people who wants that thing is a person with a lot of power or influence, they might be able to use that power or influence to make sure that they're the ones who get the rent control department or the snow shovel. Uh, now, in the case of rent-controlled apartments, right, there are regulations in place that try to keep people who are, have a lot of power and influence from getting them, but they don't always work. So in the case of New York, for example, here's a picture of uh, one of four rent-controlled apartments uh, uh, rented out by Congressman uh, Rangel, uh, who was not supposed to rent uh, all those rent-controlled apartments, and yet did, despite having quite a bit of money, being able to outfit uh, his apartments to look like that. Uh, here is a still from a movie. Uh, this is Maureen O'Hara and Mia Farrow, uh, and this is from a movie. Uh, and this was their 11-room New York City apartment, so basically like a mansion. It was $3,500 a month, uh, which, is not, which is a fair amount of money, but it's certainly not what you'd expect to pay for a mansion in New York City. right? They were able to get rent control beside, despite being movie stars, essentially. Uh, and you know this is not the intent of the policy, obviously. That's not how why people uh, put rent control into, pla into place in the first place, but... 
you can't get rid of the fact that you have to allocate these scarce resources somehow. And if you can't use the market to do it, it's going to have to be some other way. Uh, and so you have to be really, really, really careful that whatever other way it ends up being, because it is going to have to be some other way, you can't just ignore the problem. You have to make sure absolutely that the other way that it ends up being actually gets it to go to the people that you want. And that can be trickier than you think sometimes. You can think of this a little bit more easily. It might come more easily to mind in the context of a more authoritarian society where the alternative is not necessarily uh, the market. Uh, it's you know, somebody in charge just sort of deciding who to hand things out to. Uh, well, obviously, let's say that uh, you're a warlord and you control a certain tract of land and there's excess demand for food. There's not enough food to go around. Who are you going to feed? Probably your army and not other people like peasants or the farmers who grew it for you. Uh, or maybe that there's uh, ethnic strife between two uh, groups in an area and you know there's not enough medicine to go around and one group tends to be in charge of the medicine. Well, they're going to give it to their group and not the enemies, even if the enemy really needs it. Right? Why would they give it to their enemies? That doesn't make any sense. Uh, or in a capitalist society, people who have a lot of money have a lot of influence and they might be able to get their way in ways that we might not want them to. And you know, we sort of think of the market as being something that benefits them and it, it certainly does and we'll talk about that too. But by not allowing the market to be the thing that allocates stuff, it can benefit them still in different ways uh, by being the one, by making sure that they're the ones who get that, uh, uh, that apartment even if there's an excess demand for them. Another way that this can happen is through payment in kind, right? You have some sort of price ceiling or price floor that doesn't allow the price to fluctuate. Maybe you find some other way of paying for it that gets around the price ceiling or price floor, right? Making, you know, giving one to the mayor so that he'll do you a favor later is one way that that can happen. Another good example of this is college football players, right? There's a price ceiling on what you can pay a college football player. You can pay their tuition and maybe a small stipend, but that's really it. Uh, even though they're worth much more to the employer than they actually pay them. So they get around this in some ways, right? If you really want to attract the highest level football talent, you do things like you have the nicest green rooms and the nicest locker rooms and the nicest helmets and the nicest uh, jerseys. Even if the players would rather just get paid money, uh, they're going to end up with all this nice stuff as a way to attract them because they're not allowed to be paid the amount that they're actually worth. We can think, we've been talking about price ceilings a lot, but similar problems of course exist with price floors. Uh, you can imagine instead of the, you know, the wrong sorts of buyers getting it, you can have the wrong sorts of sellers producing it, you know, sellers who aren't particularly good at it, but happen to have an in. You can think of, you know, maybe giving the contract to your buddy, even if they're not the best at it, uh, because they're your buddy. Uh, you know, there's favoritism and power over who gets to sell stuff. You can also have something called uh, if inefficiently high quality. Uh, if you have a price ceiling, it forces the price to be high. Uh, maybe people would really prefer something sort of cheap and okay, but because the price is high, you're going to basically, you know, you're going to differentiate yourself by having really high quality. Uh, maybe high quality is nice, but it might be nicer if the price were low. Uh, so uh, one example of this is with airlines. It used to be the case that airline seats were regulated and the prices were a lot higher and airlines were not, not nicer, right? You would get a meal for free with your flight and the seats were bigger and you get a whole can of soda and it was very nice. And then they deregulated the airlines and you know, prices came down and quality also came down. And it's easy to think, well, I miss those nice plane flights. Uh, but then you gotta remember that they were also much more expensive and you could still have those nice plane flights. You could just fly in first class or business, right? Instead of coach, but you would probably choose to fly coach. And if the price ceiling is there, you simply don't have the option of that much cheaper seat. So that's an example of inefficiently high quality. It's nice that we had the, you know, the free meal with the flight, but it appears that we actually prefer the cheaper seat without it because that's what we end up picking when we're given the option. Let's do a quick uh, overview of some of the math behind these price ceilings and floors. Now we've done this before, so this is just sort of a recap. Uh, let's say that we have the supply curve of P equals 10 plus 2QS. We have the demand curve of P equals 40 minus QD. Uh, and we're going to implement a price ceiling of 20. Uh, now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the price ceiling does something called binding, that it actually keeps us away from that equilibrium point. Because if it doesn't actually, if it's not actually restrictive enough to do anything, then who cares about it, right? So uh, first of all, let's find our equilibrium price and quantity and see if this actually keeps us away from it. So same as we've always done it, 10 plus 2Q star. 
equals 40 minus Q star. 3Q star equals 30. Q star equals 10, so our quantity is 10. Our price is 10 plus 2, and then Q star, which is 10. 10 plus 20 is 30, so our price is 30. We have a price ceiling of 20. We're not allowed to charge above 20. We want to charge 30, but we can't. So that is, in fact, binding. It's keeping us away from what we want to be at. Step two, uh, we're going to find our quantity supplied using the quantity uh, using the supply curve. So we're going to have 20 is equal to 10 plus 2QS. 10 equals 2QS. 5 equals QS. So our quantity supplied is 5. Use QD to get the demand curve. P, uh, 20 equals 40 minus QD, which I hope you will agree, gives us QD equal 20. So then our uh, we have excess demand, right? Demand is higher than supply, which is exactly what you'd expect when the price is too low. So our excess demand is QD minus QS, or 20 minus 5, or 15. We can also draw this on a graph and look for our deadweight loss. We've got supply, demand, we have our price ceiling, we have our equilibrium price here of 30, our price ceiling of 20. We have our QS of 5. We have our QD of 20 off of the demand curve. Uh, and we can follow that up, which gives us our nice dead weight loss triangle, DWL. Uh, we have our consumer surplus, which is below the demand curve and above the price. And we have our producer surplus, which is above the supply curve and below the price. And there we have it, right? There's how you would do a basic price ceiling equation, except now we've also added on our nice deadweight loss. Now, all of this said, what we've sort of covered today is how markets work to allocate stuff and how they do it efficiently, right? That when we have a competitive market, it will allocate things in the most efficient way possible. We're basically using our resources the best that we can. Uh, now, I've, I've been pretty straightforward in that argument, but of course, this is social science and nothing is ever that simple. Uh, and so, of course, there are exceptions to all of this. Uh, so, the first exception that we can think of is, uh, well, not really an exception exactly, but a reminder that what we're saying that competitive markets do is they maximize efficiency. That we're using our resources the most efficiently as we can, we're getting the lowest cost producers, the most efficient producers to do the producing, and the consumers with the highest marginal values to do the consuming. Uh, but efficiency isn't necessarily what we actually always want. Uh, efficiency uses the resources most, most effectively, but it doesn't, for example, care that much about things like income inequality. Right? One reason why you might have a high marginal value is because you have a high income and can afford to buy a lot of stuff and pay a lot, for, pay a lot of money for stuff. So, as you might have noticed, uh, having a, um, a competitive market sometimes leads to the allocation of goods. Who gets the stuff? The answer being the people with a lot of money. So that might not necessarily be what we actually want, but that is what competitive markets do. That is the most efficient result. So we don't necessarily want the most efficient result all the time. Uh, now, even beyond that, there are some say, cases in which even if we are thinking about, effic about efficiency, um, a market will not provide that efficiency for us. Uh, one obvious example is if the market is not competitive. I already gave the example of you know, phones. The market for, for, cell for uh, smartphones is not competitive at all. And we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, when we get to pricing power. Uh, and additionally, uh, in the next lecture, we will be talking about other kinds of exceptions where even if it is a competitive market, uh, we will end up with an inefficient result for other reasons. And so you'll have to stick around for that one as well. All right, that's all I have. Uh, hopefully uh, you're not fuming too angry out there. Uh, I guess we do have a comment section below, uh, but I ask you to tread easy, or at least maybe look at the next lecture before you do so. Uh, or maybe do an angry post on that one. Let's make it confusing. That's it. Uh, I will see you next time. Goodbye.